Hi, take your mind back to 1972 when Texas Instruments made more than chips. Look at this bad boy. Oh, the silent 700. It's upside down, so all the electrons are going to fall out. Portable data terminal from 1972. Because back in 1972, hey, like time sharing computers were all the rage, right? We didn't have personal computers back then. So uh, you needed like data terminals to connect into time sharing computers. So let's have a look at this bad boy, Texas Instruments. Oh, look at that thing of beauty. It's a joy forever. And yes, that is an acoustic coupler modem. <laughs> Fantastic. And this bad boy was advertised as being three times faster than competing terminals. How fast? Oh, it'd be lightning fast if it's three times quicker. Well, 30 characters per second. That's characters per second. But if 30 characters per second is just too fast for you, well, you can whack it into low speed mode, probably down to, what, 10 characters per second? <laughs> I love the here is key. <laughs> what? <laughs> as in, leave it in the comments if you've ever used a here is key. But the keyboard is uh, absolute classic. It contains a ton of stuff. About the only one I know is like Bell, you know, Acknowledge, um, stuff like that, that were, I'm sure, were ultra useful for the uh, uh, terminal market and logging into like time sharing computers and stuff like that. But oh, I love the like switch into uppercase. Oh, state of the art stuff. You got to remember, this is not a computer at all. It does no internal uh, computing and processing apart from like the serial interface, basically talking to a serial port or through the uh, acoustic coupler modem on the top to some form of time sharing computer, either via a, presumably you could have like direct connected it up via a uh, serial port or you hook it up via the acoustic coupler modem and it doesn't even have a display. It's got a printer. So everything that you receive, instead of going onto a screen, it goes onto a printer. So that's nuts. And it goes to show why this thing really didn't last much beyond like the early 80s. Uh, the Wikipedia page, yes, there is one for these series of uh, TI Silent 7 Silent Series uh, terminals, was that, yeah, they survived for a bit longer when modems started becoming like 1200 board modems. This thing literally could not keep up, not because the electronics and the serial port couldn't keep up, it's because they couldn't print it far, they couldn't print the characters fast enough on the paper. The actual print head, the thermal print head in here, couldn't actually print long enough, but they did uh, actually release one with a dual print head that could actually print twice as fast. So <laughs> it claims I were used into the mid 80s, but I, like apart from very niche old school apps, like I doubt anyone was using this past the mid 80s. Ooh. Supplied by computer benefits. <laughs> I wonder if they're still around. And this was pre eight digit phone numbers. So, hey, I can remember when I had to change over from a seven digit to an eight digit phone number here in Australia. They made it uh, compulsory, but computer benefits, like computer with benefits. <clears throat> wow, it's got a contrast pot. Made in the United States of America. Beautiful, and there's not much on the back. There's an IEC power connector. There's a um, non-standard looking serial interface, presumably. And it was originally owned by Facom, Facom. <laughs> I, used to use, I used to work at Paycom. <clears throat> that was my first job, actually. And for all you young kiddies out there that don't know what this is, <laughs> it's an acoustic coupler modem, and it went over the phone handset, because phone handsets used to look like this, you know, with the coily cord and everything else. You used to connect it across here and it would generate tones and it would receive tones um, on here and that's how it did it. It sent it through the phone line as little beeps. And you could send, you know, like well, 300 board, 300 bits per second was, you know, a huge back in the day. And then it went to 1200 bits per second, 1200 board. Ah, oh, that was, you know, black magic. Because you've got to remember the analog phone line has and still has like a very limited 
bandwidth. So it's actually quite difficult to get more than like a few hundred board down a phone line without doing, you know, real fancy uh, techniques, which they invented over the years. And, you know, like to get like your fastest, which was like 56K, there may have been ones that were... Uh, a little bit faster, but anyway, like the 56k, which are quite a lot of uh, you will no doubt uh, remember, and probably anyone still using 56k dial up? Anyone? I'm sure, there are. Anyway, that uses really advanced uh, protocols to fit everything into the bandwidth. So, anyway, this was quite common, and of course, it accommodated different size um, handsets like that by. <laughs> Just love playing with an old school acoustic coupler. It's great. Anyway, I'm going to power this bad boy up before I take it apart. Sorry about that, but I'm just desperate to see if it still does anything. So here we go. There's mains in there. Is there a power switch? Oh. Oh, yeah, look. The head's moving. So obviously it's got some sort of echo thing happening where my stuff echo the what I'm typing echoes onto the keys, but it's obviously not doing anything. R return. There we go. There we go. So hey, this sucker works, but obviously the thermal head's not working and it's not it's not advancing, so I'm not sure what the deal is. Line feed. Paper advance. Oh, fail but it, it, like it's going through the business oh look at the yellowing on the plastic from all the from the fire retardant and flathead screws none of this phillips rubbish oh no my paper fell out damn it <laughs> paper's still in great nick by the way date code october 1978 fantastic ah lease it's a lease job you can lease this bad boy and the use of paper not meeting TI specification may void warranty. Warning, Will Robinson. And here we go. I'm afraid this is not going to be the most interesting teardown. I'm more, in oh, more intrigued by just the, uh, <laughs> just the novelty of a terminal like this. And uh, oh, look at that optical encoding wheel. Wow. So that does your positional movement for your printhead. So that'd be like each individual character, each indi individual position, and you drive it and go, next character, next character. Dit, dit, dit. But this is hilarious. This was what was making all the noise. I'm not sure if you heard it, but <laughs> look at the fan. <laughs> it's just blowing air over the... <laughs> I just... Sorry, that's hilarious. <laughs> just somehow it blows air into here out of the i don't know it seems to be like blowing it over the paper what this is just hilarious i, <laughs> I don't, don't know why that's funny it just is and the sprug capacitor fanboys go wild oh fantastic no wonder they still work oh tip 41 power transistor just stuck on with the mica washer and the how you doing uh, thermal paste Terrific. I think, I think we've got a 79 uh, series regulator in there. Probably got a 78 series over there. Probably another couple of trannies stuck down there as well. Just like on this just little aluminium vertical heatsink. Does the business. As for the PCB, none of this solder mask rubbish. We've got uh, tin plate, of course. And with the black silk screen just directly on top of the tracers. No wackers. State-of-the-art flat flex <laughs> going over to our print head. There we go. There's the rest of our board under there. As you can see, there's basically no processor in there. It's just going to be a serial interface and print head driver. That's it. And, you know, keyboard decoder. Check out the uh, potting type gunk they got down there. Uh, I don't know why they decided to whack it on just that top bunch of components there. Um, I'm not sure what the deal is. Oh, check out the mains input. 
what's doing here? Anyway, we do have it uh, input mains fused. Check out the three kilovolt uh, ceramic caps in there. Just uh, love the old schoolness. And they've got the um, heat shrink, uh, well, the uh, insulation tubing over the leads as well. Thank you very much. Looks like there's a common mode choke going on down in there. And presumably, what? This is a weird ass looking. Trans I assume it's a transformer. What? Anyway, this is the main switch. TO3 power tranny there. Um, offhand, I don't know it. An SJ7432. <laughs> 78 uh, mid. All the uh, components in here are mid uh, 78 date code. And those who want to see the base of that, they've also, where they put that uh, gunk before, they've also put some on the bottom side here. So, I, like, was moisture? A problem at that part in the circuit? I'm not sure. Made in the USA. TI, I love the TI logo. Classic. Anyway, there's no obvious uh, bodges on this board, so nice job, whoever did the layout on that. Sweet. Oh, some dust accumulation from 1978. I presume it's never been cleaned. <laughs> And they're, they're all uh, tip series power transistors, probably being used as uh, series pass regulation elements. Actually, looking at all this, I think this is all part of the power supply here. And given that this puppy is not your standard linear transformer, it looks like this is a switching uh, converter, given that the power this thing uh, would be taking too, of course, it'd need a fairly decent uh, linear supply. I think we've got a big ass switching supply here, and I think you'll find that these two um, big ass caps here are uh, 240 volt um, direct, uh, as in 240 volt AC, um, much higher uh, DC volt. I think it's got uh, direct mains rectification and your traditional switch mode. Um, supplies. So there seems to be a lot of, uh, quite a bit going on here. Are all uh, discrete transistor, none of this integrated circuit rubbish going on in the switching power supply. So I'll see if I can find a find a schematic for this thing. Um, because yeah, it looks power supply looks fairly involved. So let's have a some look at some of these puppies down here where you'd expect to find our uh, TTL. We've got uh, TI, of course. TI are going to win the uh, win the bomb for this thing. Um, SN98614. I don't know those offhand. Um, I don't know what the unpopulated socket uh, is there, but all these other like little 8-pin jobbies up here, they're all op amps and whatnot. So I would presume that all that is part of the uh, bit detection, you know, uh, level detection and uh, bit detection... Uh, circuitry for the uh, serial interface. Let's get this keyboard out of here. It pops out of these little plastic holders. Hello? Oh no! Oh! Hello! No! Oh, it does have this microprocessor rubbish. I was hoping to do everything discreet with some character generator ROMs, but no! Oh, for all you 8080 fanboys! Look at that! Genuine TI TMS 8080 from 1978. Beautiful. I know you want the close-up. There it is. Isn't it a thing of beauty? And it's got hot snot on either end just to keep it in. Oh, uh, I do believe that's a single wipe socket too. Ah, evil things they are. And we got some TTL 74S series because they needed the extra speed in there just for uh, the, some sort of interface there. I am going to presume that this puppy down here is a mask ROM, because I don't see a ROM anywhere else, so yeah. Uh, we've got some 74LS stuff around here. Oh, 74L. Oh, they didn't want to piss away uh, the extra current with the LS series. They didn't need the speed, so they went, oh, well, well put in the low power version. Thank you very much. And uh, what's that crystal up there? 12 meg by the looks of it. Screaming. I don't know what that other 40 pin jobby is down in there. I have to look her up. And the keyboard's made by Micro Switch in Freeport, Illinois. Were they the Ducks Guts back in the day? I don't know. Leave it in the comments. The keys do actually have a beautiful tactile feel to them. Oh. Ooh, is that an inserted pin mistake? You notice it? Yeah, it's been out there. 
or is that a genuine open pin mod? Hmm. Well, I think that's an insertion mistake, so maybe that pin didn't matter. <laughs> All pins matter. No, it's actually connected. It's, yeah, it's connected to a trace. Don't think that was making contact. And if you're going to do an open circuit mod, you would definitely bend the pin out horizontal. Um, definitely wouldn't bend it back under like that. I stand corrected slagging this poor thing off for potentially having single wipe sockets. No, they're dual, swipe, uh, dual wipe in the vertical form factor. Wow, you don't see many of those. Let's just plug this thing back in when it's opened up, shall we? Dun. Return. Line feed. Hey, we're feeding the paper now. So I actually plugged that, I bent that pin back in and plugged it in. So, uh, I, I don't know. Was that a, whoa. <laughs> nice. But thermal print head's not working though. But it, the process is obviously working and it's responding to um, stuff. So, yeah. Oh, I'm an idiot. Forgot to plug the print head in. Like, the thermal print head is moving, but it's not connected. Oh. Let's try it again. Oh, yeah, it's there. It's there. I think it's printing something. Maybe just see that. It's very faint. I love how, yeah, line feed it just literally just feeds it. Yeah, you can see some of the, like, there's one line of dots there. So it looks like only one of the one pin on the print head's working. Ooh, five ohms impedance protected. Just to show you the other side of the mechanism here. I don't know why that's got it's sort of like just flapping around in the breeze at the end there. Not sure was that supposed to push in or screw on? Not sure what the deal is there. Anyway, that looks like oh, maybe it that you can see the head see the head moving out with that but i think it was all the way on i think it was touching did manage to get a couple of characters up there so maybe the print head wasn't against it but it doesn't seem to be actually printing characters anymore so I, oh i don't know this thing's a bit temperamental but wait i found the service manual for this thing let's take a look i love the old school service manuals I just love these old brochures. Check these out. <laughs> Look at this. Hey, only 19.95. That only weighs 13 pounds. <laughs> it's half the weight of the currently most popular portable, our own model 735. This is the 745. <laughs> this is great. And oh, <laughs> surprised it didn't have a rotary dial phone. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. I had a rotary dial phone when I was a kid. Jeez, right into my teens, probably. Oh, you young whippersnappers. New portable data terminal from TI. £25. $25.95. <laughs> Love it. How does she type with fingernails like that? I... She doesn't, is the answer. <laughs> and look, she looks so... <laughs> she looks so happy walking to work, <laughs> carrying her £35 portable data terminal. <laughs> That's great stuff. Uh, 30 characters per second, twice as fast. <laughs> so, sorry, three times faster than the competition. Texas Instruments Incorporated. All right, but here we have the service manual. This is the 1978 edition. So, oh, maintenance manual, they call it. And these things are so comprehensive. They don't do this anymore. Just be amazed at how much detail they're going to have in this. I haven't looked through it all, but I'm sure it is massively comprehensive. Full duplex, they're explaining, yep, full and half duplex and all that sort of stuff, because, you know, people have to, well, <laughs> technicians have to understand this stuff. How the paper goes in, the platen, all the rest of it. Theory of operation. Nobody does a theory of operation anymore. Give me the old school magazine projects, like I used to write back in the day and get published, and you'd have a theory of operation of your circuit. You know, everyone publishes their open source stuff these days, and you hard almost never see like a theory of operation anymore you never see a block diagram you never see anything like that so gone are those days it's a real shame 110 board 300 board <laughs> and all your ascii tables your control codes and whatnot there's the print head driver 
There you go, contrast is 0 to 75 milliamps. Ceramic heatsink. And there's the print head element driver. Will, did we see those? Mate, um, that, let me go to the power supply section, because I might have been wrong about those TIP41 transistors. They might be the print head drivers, because I didn't see them near the connector, so I think they're way back up. And there's the uh, print head stepping motor with the wheel that we saw with the uh, photo transistor. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> There's the printed stepping motor driver. Look, it's all there. This is all the theory of operation. There's your character set, which would be uh, burned into the mask uh, ROM because we didn't see any of that EEPROM rubbish in here. And uh, and there's all the like all the other codes and everything, which I've rarely used more than like a handful of those really, even back in the day when you control G still works. There's the power supply converter voltage regulator failure protect. Soft start. Ah, oh, it's even got soft start. Fantastic. Look at this. Here's all the theory of operation just for the power supply. Fantastic. The 8080. So comprehensive. Then we got flow charts. Wow, brilliant. Ah, oh, there's the acoustic. There's the frequency uh, shift key in for the. I thought they only used frequency shift key in at the uh, 1200 board. Oh yes, no, of course they did frequency shift key in. They there's two separate frequencies they use, the two separate ones they use. So there's a transmit and a receive pair with two different frequencies each, and that's how the uh, 300 board worked. I believe from my rusty memory. I'm sure everyone will tell me if I'm wrong. I'm not going to bother to check that. <laughs> and uh, like you know, 1100 kilohertz or something. You know. Now we're getting into Troubleshooting checklists. Fantastic. Like, this is brilliant stuff. Look at this. Look at these, like, they're going to have lots of exploded diagrams too, I'm sure. Look at this. Everything's got its own part number. Yeah, here we go. Now we're talking. Look at this. Beautiful. We've got the bomb. Look at, you know, it's a huge amount of details gone into this. Some people drew this and then checked it and then triple checked it. Fantastic. I was still do doing hand-drawn stuff like this at... Uh, yeah, yeah, we're still doing it at Surcell. So we're still doing it. Like, I'm talking 12 years ago, probably. Not that long ago, we were still... Oh, maybe... Okay, like, I'll say 15 to be safe. But, uh, yeah, like, 12, 15 years ago, I was still doing hand-drawn documentation like this on sheets... And we'd have to photo. We'd have to. We'd have to master copy. Then we'd have a photocopied copy, which was on a different uh, part of the site, just in case half the building burnt down or something. And then we had an off-site uh, copy as well, and all these huge A3 folders. I've still got some of the original um, Surcell grid paper, like uh, Tallies and Surcell and other companies that I've worked at. It was all it wasn't one big company. Changed names like four times. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I was still doing that not that long ago. Like my job previous to Outium. Stuff like that. Cutting, pasting, using glue <laughs> to st stick stuff onto the A3 sheets and stuff like that. We were still doing that. And then if you wanted to make changes, you took the original, you photocopied it, <laughs> and you added. <laughs> so it got progressively worse with each revision. <laughs> it was great. Anyway, look at this. Look at this. Overlays. Fantastic. Oh, look at the heatsink assembly. How to tie down the capacitors, I think I saw there. Now we're talking. We're getting into schematics now. Look, and they give you the pinouts for the chip. Fantastic. They don't do that anymore. Here's an overall block diagram. Receive current loop. Low power supply. The uh, interface reference. Wow. That's all the PC. Well, the PC. Oh, hey, hello. Here's your power supply. There you go. This is why it looks so complex. Here's your mains input. You can see the cursor. Yeah, you can just see the cursor. Here's the cursor up here. And there's common mode choke. Full wave bridge rectifier. Yep. Some high voltage caps. Uh, no. Where are the... Oh, yeah. Yeah, five, 500 volts. There we go. Got our high voltage caps. And that was the weird-ass transformer that we had there. It's a custom job with all these different windings. And bingo, on the output, on the secondary side here, has no... 
uh, linear regulation. So there's no linear voltage regulators on the output of that. So they're just driving that directly from the uh, transformer. There's no feedback path to that. So it's forward uh, referenced. So uh, uh, fail, protect latch, overcurrent sense, all that sort of stuff. So all those transistors that we saw, they have to be, I reckon they're for the printhead driver. There's nothing else in there that would require A, so many of those transistors, and B, require them to be on a heatsink. So I'm sure if we go down, there's your TMS8080 and your ROM, everything else. Brilliant. Piezoelectric sound disc. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific keyboard and mechanism interface. Let's have a look. Print head stepper motor. Aha! There you go. Tip 41Bs. There they are. Yep. Yep. So they would... Does it show them on a heatsink? 12. It's got 12 next to it. So that probably points to a heatsink somewhere else in the document. Yep. So there you go. That's what all the driver transistors were for. And... US acoustic coupler modem, originate mode. <laughs> Hands up if you had to switch the answer, originate switch. Yay. Can you see my hand? There it is. Difference integrator, carrier detect. There you go. So that's all, I was right. That's all those op amps and stuff that we saw in there with the whole bunch of diodes and caps and resistors and other stuff. That was all that part of, it, it had to be. There was, there's no other reason for that to exist. So yeah, you got your bandpass filters. So you'd have to have a couple of bandpass filters and you'd have to, yeah, your carrier detector, your receive clamp, difference integrator, the whole works. So all your uh, old school analog modem, we've got two. Oh, different standards. That's US acoustic coupler modem, originate mode, and this is CCITT acoustic coupler modem, originate mode. Right, this sheet applies to assembly, blah, blah. There you go. It's got, it's got the frequencies in there. Uh, FSK, 1650, uh, 1850, there you go, receive a transmitter, go up here, oh, they're up to 2200, what, 22, I don't remember it being over 2k, okay, not for 300 board, wow, originate mode, uh, Japan, Japan's got a different standard, there you go, so they had to change this board, I'm surprised they didn't put it on like a daughter board or something, um, gee, look at all the notes, wow, Unbelievable. And look at the, those exploded diagrams. That's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Oh, look at that. Look at the heatsink assembly. Wow. Yeah, that's terrific. How to put your washers on, how to assemble it. Fantastic. <laughs> got, got the foils. Got the copper foil artwork. But there you go. That is brilliant. Is it not? Oh, more. More. We've got a different power supply, do we? Wow. Wow. Okay. It's, looks like there's schematics for multiple versions here. So, yeah, and then you get into the case and everything else. All your assemblies, stuff like that. Look at that. They just don't make service manuals like that anymore. That is absolutely brilliant. So, hats off to the designers back in the day. Like, it's just so much effort you know, to draw nice schematics like this. You know, it, it, it really is a lot of effort. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that look at this uh, silent 700 computer from the 1970s, which is, a, it's not even a computer. Ow. Um, <laughs> it's not even a computer. It's just a terminal that doesn't even have a screen. You know, you had to print it on the paper and you had to continually wait. Imagine if you ran out of paper and, I oh, know I can't read what's coming in. Like, unbelievable. So, just the amount of paper they would have wasted. So, yeah, you would have been, you know, like a, just like a single line screen would have, well, no, it wouldn't have been handier because then you wouldn't, you'd have to scroll back all the time. So, you'd need like a, you need like a CRT kind of thing. But these portable data, data terminals did the business. So, let us know if you actually used one of these puppies back in the day and um, <laughs> how important it was. So, anyway. Hope you liked that video. If you did, give it a big thumbs up. As always, catch you next time.